Good morning. Still morning, yes. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for the invite. Uh, two other thanks. Thanks to the AV team, because I screwed things up just before Lisa's presentation this morning, and that's why we are all late. Uh, and also, thank you to the translators. It's an amazing job that they do. Always thank the translators. They're also in a position of power. <laughs> so that's my starting, uh, starting with people. I'm going to talk about minding. It's called Mind the Gap. There's a, there's a sort of, if those of you have been to, ever been to London, there's a sort of joke you'll understand later. And I really want to talk about designing multi-channel services for people. Um, because one of the things that happens often when I, I come to sort of interaction design or UX conferences, I see a lot of wonderful stuff. Uh, and a lot of it's about screens and, uh, and not so much about people. Although, actually, uh, Jess and Lisa have, have completely talked about people this morning, which is great. So Bill Mogridge, some of you might know him. He was one of the key people at IDEO. Um, died in 2012, sadly. And, and he was really one of the, the godfathers of human-centered design. He was one of the people who said, hey, let's get ethnographers and psychologists and people like that into the design studio. And his, his mantra was, you know, start with the people. And, and he was responsible for the product design of the, of the first laptop, um, this grid compass computer. And he said, you know, when he got it home, the prototype home, he said the actual, the, the sort of box, the, the thing itself, the object itself wasn't really that interesting. What was really ha interesting was what was happening between him and what was going on on the screen. So that was the, the you know, the sort of birth of him thinking about uh, interaction design and user experience. And you know, that's very, very true and very important, but here's what the situation is today. So we have lots and lots and lots of different screens. I was in a hotel recently, and there were five different screens in the room, not including the, the two that I'd brought with me. And there were two screens to, to um, adjust the air conditioning, and I never really worked out how that worked, ever. So you know, here's some screens that you might have uh, you know, in the course of a week or even a day sometimes, or using a particular service, you might come across lots of different things. And so you can spend a lot of time designing each one of those beautifully, but if you're constantly asking the users to switch mental models all the time, it, it can be a real problem. And it all then falls over when this kind of thing happens. All right, so this is uh, a Deutsche Bahn ticket machine, so the train system in Germany. And, you know, running late for the train, turn up, blue screen of death. So, uh, okay, where's, you know, where's the, the, the UX there? Where's the experience there? And you see, you know, when these things go really badly wrong, this kind of thing happens. So you get a lot of people, um, it, whoever's working at this, this is a, a, a ticket machine for, at a car park to pay your, your parking ticket. And obviously what's gone on here is whoever works there <laughs> has had to sort of hack the system the best they can. Um, because they're obviously getting like hundreds of people every day going, this machine doesn't work. And you have this really weird si situation where they're saying, uh, press here to start, okay. And this says, um, press, this, press gray box first, and the arrow goes to this other sticker. And no, no, this gray box over here, but actually they mean this gray box over here. All right, so, it, and then there's all this other stuff. No coins, credit cards, change machines over there. The whole thing is a, is a disaster. This just gets worse and worse as you get into multi-channel services, because there's loads of opportunities for this kind of thing to happen across every single channel. And one of the things that you need is a, is a sort of shift of a mindset. So um, this is in Germany too, that services aren't products. Now I had a kind of, I've often had this discussion, particularly in the digital world, when people say I'm a product manager for a digital thing, a product, and I'm always saying, but it's not a product, it's a service. And you see quite often, uh, who, uh, who has Apple Care here? Does anyone have Apple Care on there? Well, no, a few people. It's, it's like saffron in its kind of price to weight ratio. You, play, you pay an awful lot, and you, well, you can still buy a box of Apple Care if you go into a store. I don't think you get a CD anymore. You probably get, I don't know what you get, actually, a piece of paper with a code on it? I don't, I don't know. Here, this is MediaMark, this is in Germany. It's a bit like Best Buy in North America. I don't know what the equivalent here is place where you go and buy you know, a TV or a washing machine or something like that. Um, and here, they don't understand how to sell service, right? So that what they do understand is we know how to sell stuff on a stand in a, in a shop. So what we're going to do is we're going to sell power service, which is uh, someone to deliver your TV here. It says TV, TV leafer packet. 
and they put it in a tin. Now, I don't know what's in this tin. I presume it's not a little man who kind of unfolds and installs your TV in your, uh, in your home, but you see the kind of the, the struggle with, with this. And one of the things is, because, because services are, are multi-channel and time-based, and Jess, Jess and Lisa have, have sort of talked about this a bit, um, it's, a, it's a different kind of relationship. So if I have a, a product in my hand, I can look at it, and I can, look at, I can hold it, and I can, think, I can look at how well it's been designed or not. Or I can look at the stitching on a piece of clothing and think, yes, I want to buy that or not. Services are much more intangible. So um, insurance is the, is the kind of classic example. You can't hold your insurance in your hand. And in fact, you find out that the quality of your insurance is made up of interactions across many, many different channels, and usually with people. And in fact, you don't find out whether your insurance is any good or not until the very worst time, right, when something goes wrong. And by then, it's too late. You can't have a car crash and you have a really bad dealing with your insurance company and then go, you know what, I'm going to change my insurance company at this moment. You, you, can't, you can't get out of that. So it's, it's a much more tricky situation than it is with products. So services are really ecosystems. They're, every part affects the whole, like any other ecosystem. And if you change a detail, then uh, it affects the entire system. And if you change the, the system, like if you imagine a, a small pond or something, if, if the climate changes, the, the water temperature goes up a little bit, then what happens is everything else changes and some other organism becomes the dominant one in that pond and, and the whole ecosystem changes. And it's complicated, it's really complicated. And one of the important things is that you've, you've got all these different aspects to it and, and there's these little arrows that kind of join everything together and you look at it on a diagram and you think that makes sense, but actually they're really, really important. You, we ha as humans, we tend to look at the thing and not, the, not at the space between things and the transitions. Uh, and Jess, I think it was Jess, was uh, talking about handoffs and transitions, and they're really important. Because as pe people move between those things, that's where the problems have, that's where the gaps start. And people are really important too in services. A, a lot of the value of services comes from interactions between people, and the services are, are sort of platforms that facilitate those interactions between people, and not just um, you know, interactions with things and objects. And of course, there's, there's no shortage of channels, right? This is, I've inverted this because it usually comes out bad on projectors. This is uh, the internet map, and you can zoom into this, like the, it's like Google, it's built on the Google Maps um, API. And you can zoom in and out of uh, internet services. There's, there's uh, Google there, the big dominant thing, there's Facebook. But all of these other things, like I work with a telco in Australia, a big telco, and they were one of these tiny little dots up here. These are all digital services. These are all online services on the internet. There's a lot of them. So, if you've ever been to London, who's been to London here? Yeah. I don't come from London, actually. I used to live there. Um, you, might, you might know this. So, um, on London Underground, you have someone, they're going, mind the gap. Um, and what it is, is there's this gap between the, the train and the platform, and, and they don't want you to fall down it and, and, and die because that's not very good for London Underground. So they have this thing called Mind the Gap. And it's a, it's a really important mantra, I think, for designing services. Um, because you've got these transitions between different uh, service providers, and you've got transitions between different channels, as customers are moving through it, they're, they're constantly switching. And traditionally, you have a, a sort of silo-based organization where, you know, uh, like Lisa was talking about this morning, you've got one department and another department and another, another department, they're actually all having some input onto the, the, a particular service and that from the customer's point of view or the citizen's point of view, you're experiencing as one whole thing and you can't understand why there are all these gaps in it. Flying is, is an example I'm going to use. It's, it's, uh, my workshop was about flying and I, I believe Jess's was as well. Flying is one of the most expensive bad experiences you can buy. It's incredible. Right? You, it's generally just got worse and worse, and it's got more and more expensive. And, well, in some areas. And then there's the whole sort of low-budget thing, which I'll, I shall come to in a moment. So this is Lavrens. This is uh, one of the guys who wrote the book with me. And he was trying to, this is actually a picture of him flying to Berlin from, um, or flying back to Oslo from, from me. But um, he was trying to uh, fly with his family from Oslo to New York. And 
he had a, a, a young child and he also had a baby. And he wanted to, um, he wanted to book a seat for his baby because it, it was a long haul flight and he wanted to have the extra space and he was, you know, was happy to pay for the, for the extra space. Now, first of all, there's a kind of, uh, the first gap is like this kind of uh, interface gap. You can't book a, a seat for a child under two years old on, on this particular airline. And often that's the case. They, they either assume, I don't know if it's a legal thing, that you want to, that you have the baby on your lap and you don't book a seat. So um, he, he said, well, no, I really want to do this. So he called up the call center and they said, very helpful, don't worry, just book another seat. Don't worry that the passenger details don't match. So, okay. Um, so he called, he, he tried to do this and he gets assigned seats uh, straight away and they're distributed across the cabin. And he's, at this point he's thinking, oh, oh no. Uh, so he, uh, he calls customer services again and uh, he says, no, I, uh, no, he tries to fix it, that's right. He tries to sort of rebook his seats or reassign his seats and he loses his seat bookings altogether and he thinks, oh no. So he thinks, okay, um, I will, uh, I'll call up, he calls customer services and they say, uh, yeah, I don't have any access greater than you do over the website. Okay, all right, well. And he thinks, hang on, you know, I'm a service designer, I know how this works. 24 hours before my flight, I'm going to be, um, get an email, it's gonna invite me to check in, and then at that point, I can, I can do my seats. So, okay, he, he does that. 24 hours before his flight, he gets the email, goes to check in, and uh, he, because he loses all of his seats completely, he then, he then calls up again, and he says, look, I don't, have any, uh, I don't have any seats, they're all distributed across the cabin originally, and now I've, got, I've lost them completely. And the uh, call center staff says, um, don't worry, <laughs> just get to the airport early, and at the check-in uh, desk, they'll sort it out for you. He thinks, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust in this, but I'm gonna just manage this part of the relationship here. <laughs> so he's looking for taxis, he's looking for alternative hotels, he's looking for uh, alternative flights and thinking this could go wrong. And he says to his wife, you know what? Because this is 24 hours before he leaves, right? This might go wrong, uh, we might have to alter our plans. So anyway, so he gets to the airport, and, and so there's the first, and another gap is, the gap between the, the call center staff and the check-in staff. So he gets to the check-in, explains the situation, and they say, we can't assign you any seats until the plane has arrived at the gate uh, and, it's, and, and it's ready for boarding. Don't worry, get to the gate early and they'll sort it out. Yeah. Now, if anyone's ever traveled with children, you'll know this, this is a really quite a stressful situation to be in. So when he gets to the gate, he's there, and he, he's, as soon as the boarding staff, as soon as the gate staff arrive, he kind of runs over with his baby on his arm and's kind of doing the emotional blackmail and saying, oh, please help me out. <laughs> and, um, and then there's this kind of gap between the, the staff and the computer system. So the staff are having this argument, there's two people there, and they're having this argument about how best to cheat the system. You know, one of them's going, no, do an F3 and an Z2 or something, and no, 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 it's much better. All this kind of arcane codes and stuff, the UX to those kinds of things is really crazy. And they say to him, don't worry, take a seat, we'll come over when it's sorted. Now, the story ends well, okay? So he, in fact, the human element wins and they, they sort out his seating and they all get seated together. But that's an awful lot of stress uh, for something he expected to happen anyway. Right? So in each one of those situations, you've got a little sort of crack which, if you were the organization, you might look at and go, oh, that's not so bad. How many people are going to want to book a seat for their kid under, you know, for their baby? Or, oh, that's not so bad, he just had to go to somewhere else. But it's the accumulation of those things, those little cracks in the, in the service, and they open up to be like a crevasse. Okay? And it feels like doing something quite normal that, you should, it, that should just work, feels like you're doing this. It's, it doesn't look like it's a very big gap to cross, and it's not, you know, it's, you might say, it's a first world problem. But actually, you know, you're just really terrified that you're going to fall into that crevasse and be lost forever. Right? And, and that's a very, very poor experience. I'm just going to have some water. You might have seen uh, this recently, too, which all looks very fascinating. 
This is, a, you know, the Apple's watch, my American Airlines check-in. And, you know, that's great. It raises my expectations right up here, and I'm man of the future. I go, boop, I'm checking in, look at, oh. Oh, hang on, and I have to wait in security for an hour, or, or I have to wait in immigration for an hour. So, you know, you can have one touch point that's really beautifully designed, but it's rubbish if the rest of it doesn't work, and it's also rubbish if the rest of the organization doesn't, doesn't work either. So, you know, I'm repeating something that uh, the others have already said, which is really this. It's about crafting human experiences across channels and not a, a user experience. Some of you probably know this book from Dan Saffer, Micro Interactions, and he talks a lot about how um, there are lots of little sort of micro interactions, small interactions that make quite a difference and, and bring personality. No, it's very worth a read. My view on it is that sort of everything is a micro interaction. I sort of think that humans judge our relationships with services and with other co uh, companies and organizations in the way we know how to judge any other relationships, which is a human to human one. Uh, we're hardwired to really understand subtle shifts in those relationships. And when it feels like it's unfair, it's because it is unfair. And you know, when you're treated badly by a, a, a government service or a corporation, it feels unfair because you wouldn't do that to another human being. And somehow, that, when it gets into those official bodies, it all falls to pieces. So lots of those tiny micro-interactions. Now, if you're talking to someone, you're having coffee, and they go, yeah, 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 it's really interesting. So, no, no, really, I'm listening. So just, um, you know, you think, even if it's a little moment where they're, they're sort of looking away, you know, marriages break up because of those kinds of things. Micro-interactions make a big difference. So some touch points are really well uh, thought through and branded. This is a, um, a department store in Switzerland where you buy, uh, you get a coffee and you get this lovely truffle. Uh, and it's very nicely sort of put together. It's actually a very expensive, overpriced coffee. I, I like to see it as a, you buy the truffle and you get the coffee for free. It's kind of more what it's like. Um, the, the quality is definitely in the chocolate, not in the, in the coffee. But it's very, if someone's really thought through what should that experience be like. Often what happens, though, is that they're not really thought through at all. They just happen. So this is a, a well, anyone just want to shout out, what kind of place do you think this is? A, oh, you've got it first, first off, a bank. Right? <laughs> Maybe that's common here. Yeah. In, in Switzerland, this is unthinkable, right? So the, the plant would be made of gold, for starters, right? <laughs> so in, in, in here is something where, you know, it's a bank, it's in Italy, and I'm going in and I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to use this ATM machine now. Is, am I going to wake up with no kidneys? What's going to happen here? I don't really know. This is, you know, you think about the money the bank has spent on their branding, their image and everything, all of those other IT systems, and this is my sort of first touch point. You know, someone's the door uh, hook doesn't work. Someone's propped the door open with a piece of cardboard. That hasn't worked. Someone's then put this plant over there and it's wrapped up all the kind of doormat and the plant is half dead anyway. Right? And it's just a really terrible, it doesn't instill confidence. So what happens with those things, if you don't design things, other people will. Now if you're doing user research, look for handmade signs. They're really good uh, uh, sign that something's not working on, on the kind of front line of things, that some policy or situation from above is often not working. So, you know, people will design their own things. If you're a, an organization or a company and you don't design some kind of return channel of feedback that actually is, is valuable, people will create their own ones too. So the, if Ryanair is a budget airline in, in Europe that um, lots of people love to hate, this guy hates it so much, got a whole website dedicated to it. This is um, a guy in, in um, a store in Optus. Optus is a telecoms company in, uh, in Australia, and, and this guy was trying to change the ownership of his iPad um, data contract. Got so frustrated, he'd been into the store like four times, been on hold for three hours or something. He went into a store and he chained himself to the desk in the store. Now, of course, you're in a store that's full of smartphones and people with smartphones, and what happens? Someone takes a photo, posts it on the internet. And eventually, you know, he, he said, okay, I've made my protest. Uh, back to Ryanair. Then this is a little bit unfair because these are some of the old assets. Ryanair have actually redesigned their site kind of a bit better. Uh, there's lots of dark patterns still in UI patterns in there. So, but, you know, the whole experience of traveling isn't just the website and, you know, the flight. It's 
it's finding out where to fly in the first place. It's all the stuff about having to print out my own booking pass and having to pay, uh, boarding pass and having to pay for it. But it's also all the other people in the airline. So in Stansted Airport, in, in, it's not even in London, it's about an hour away from London. Um, you know, the staff, everyone's just really annoyed. And the staff kind of herd people around like cattle. It's like, can everyone get over here, please? Can you all get in this line over here, please? And, it, and, and as a passenger, you just go, oh, I hate this. Everyone's then on the plane really angry. And they have a very quick turnaround time of their planes. One of the, way, the ways they save money is they turn the, the planes around. They, they sort of clean them and, and uh, very quickly and refuel them. So if someone's sick or if something terrible happens, that doesn't really get dealt with. Right, so it, it, by the time you then get to London, you realize I'm not actually in London even. And then it's just the, the whole thing is, a, is a, a lots of small bad experiences aggregate to a kind of really terrible thing. So the thing is to look for where those frustrations are and how they, how they manifest. <laughs> that's mean, isn't it? If anyone's ever worked in a place like that's mean. The service of frustrations was much about um, inaction as, as action. You know, people trying to do something and nothing happening. Jess talked about, you know, this, there was just this lack of feedback to things. So those kinds of things are so important. The thing is, I don't want to be a professional Amazon.com shopper. I want to buy something on Amazon. I want to buy, I want to buy a present. And I say I want to buy a Father's Day gift. And the underlying motivation there is really I want to tell my father I love him. Right? So, so the, the further you go down that, that process, the more you, the, the opportunities to actually tackle that underlying issue or that underlying need uh, are much broader. And when you're just at that kind of Amazon.com level or just at the, the, the product level or one single touch point level, you're only really dealing with a kind of tiny bit. You're, not, you're, you're dealing with a kind of symptom of a symptom of the need and not actually the underlying need. And you're also are having to deal with uh, interfacing with backstage people and eco-services and systems. So, you know, when I order something from Amazon, arguably the entire infrastructure, apart from making Jeff Bezos lots of money, or not, um, is there to in facilitate a relationship between me and that person there in the bottom right-hand corner. I say, I'd like something, uh, and, and could you send it to me? Can you take it off a shelf and send it to me? Or with everyone else who's ever shopped in Amazon, you know, and I, I, I don't know what I want, but I, I, I did like this. Can you tell me something that might be good? You know, and those uh, services are dependent on other third-party services too. So that uh, Royal Mail in the UK lost two contracts from Amazon because they couldn't deliver in time. And if, if Amazon can't deliver quickly, then that's its main USP is that, well, what's the point? I might as well just go to the bookshop. So uh, everyone loves a sort of clickbait link list of top 10 guiding principles. I don't know how many principles, I didn't count them actually, but here are my guiding principles. One is a, a, a classic one, which is designed for, for needs and not wants. This is a device, um, anyone guess? When, when do you think this was designed? What year? Sorry? 1990s, okay, 1995. 2007, it came on the market. When did the iPhone come on the market? 2007. So this is, and then a Swisscom, this is a device from Swisscom. They're not stupid, Swisscom, they're very successful. Um, but they designed a device that uh, you can text message on your landline. Marketing said, there's a massive market for this. We've asked people. Now, I don't know exactly what they asked, but I can only guess that if you ask people, would you like to be able to text message on your landline, they say, yes. Um, except that what happened is nobody wanted it. You know, because if you're sitting on your sofa and the device is over there, and you go, oh, you know, I'd quite like to text someone now. Oh, this is going to cost me something. Oh, I'll just do this. People are lazy, right? So, and you don't want another device that just does one, one thing. So, you know, they ended up having to give them away in stores. I'm convinced there's a mountain in Switzerland somewhere that's just full of these things. Um, understand trust. It's delicate but potent. It's a really crucial thing. It's very easy to break trust. If you get a letter saying, you know, I get a letter saying, dear Mrs. Pauline, I immediately think, oh, you know, what's going on behind the scenes in this company? You know, uh, small things break trust all the time. Um, but if you can build it up, then it's really, really valuable. And, and, and again, what Jess and Lisa were talking this morning, I think is a really good example. Uh, I'm not a fan of the demographic personas. I encounter them a lot. Uh, um, 
I'm going to be a bit. Is anyone from marketing in here? Oh, yes. See you later. Um, I don't mean to be too marketing bashing, but they tend to have a, a fixed, uh, you know, focus on a lot of quantitative stuff, a lot of demographic data, and then they sort of come up with personas, and they're all, they're all full of nouns and adjectives. You know, this is Jane, she's 32, drives a BMW, lives in Notting Hill. Um, uh, it has lots of sort of descriptions, but it doesn't really tell you anything ab about verbs. It doesn't tell you any actions that she's trying to do, right? And, and actually, you know, this is a fake photo, and I'm, I made this up. So if you find out the, the thing that people are trying to achieve, it, it throws up all the touch points. So I was trying to renew my driver's license, and then I went there, and this happened, and I had this, and there was this queue, and then I encountered this person. All of those then reveal, reveal all the things you can deal with uh, as designers. Uh, to echo again what Jess and I might as well just say what Jess and Lisa said this morning and just go, I think. Um, designing with people versus for people. You know, as designers, we kind of get trained a bit to, to be the big problem solvers and we're going to solve your problems for you. Um, but with a lot of these things, you really, really need to design with people. That's frontline staff and understand their expertise. You know, that, that person who, sits, who put all those stickers on that ticket machine in the car park, I'm sure he'd have a lot of insights into what would make a good ticket machine. Be personal. There's only one way, really, to be personal, and it's to be personal. Right? If you get those you know, people phoning up and saying, hi, Mr. Plain, I'd really like to sell you a new cable service, and I'm your friend, and you, know, and, and you just think, you know, I know you're just reading off a script. I'm not stupid. It, it's almost worse than if someone's very, very formal with you. Um, this is a, a letter. When I, I went to a conference in the south of England, in Cornwall, it's the bottom little tip of England, and I, I went by train from Germany, and the train started off really, and went up through France, started off sort of really big and nice, and as I, as I got further into England, they got sort of smaller and worse. And um, when I arrived, it took me 13 hours, but when I arrived, um, instead of just having sort of a printed out thing, the, the conference organizer had handwritten letters. This is really handwritten, it's not a typeface, uh, to all the speakers and said, you know, welcome uh, to you. And it was really nice. I'd really kind of thought about that. And that kind of human connection makes a big difference. In fact, the only thing with the problem with this example is I've recently seen that um, the latest marketing trick is to program robots that have a um, fountain pen sort of connected to them to handwrite, to fake handwrite letters. That's, that's evil. <laughs> Stay on people's channels, okay? So if someone emails you, email them back. If they phone you, phone them back. Don't keep pushing them between channels. This is a letter from Deutsche Post to a German customer, and it says, um, please enter this URL into your browser. It's, it's even worse, actually, because it says, the, the paragraph above says, please click on the link that you previously received in your email or enter this into your browser. And in which case, I'm thinking, why are you even sending me this letter? Germans love everything written. No. Um, align your delivery with expectations. Okay, This is one of the biggest errors that happens all the time is you know, you're, you're setting an expectation here and you're delivering down here. If, and this is where the argument for, is for Ryanair, if, if, if your service is kind of down here, then, you know, set the expectations that that's what it's going to be. Don't set them up here. You know, this, is, this, is, this website has a load of these things. Um, <laughs> most attractive angle, slightly fluffed up. Right, so that's as good as it gets. Um, and so you're bound for disappointment. Look for non-intended design. I talked about those handwritten signs. There's a lot of stuff, and this is where designing with people is important, because people will do stuff on the, uh, the sort of front end, front line of service delivery, and won't necessarily think about the consequences. So I walked past this, and I thought, well, well what's Flatland Toda? I don't understand that. Oh, it's Flats Wanted, Landlord Call Today. And even when I see that now, I still read Flatland Toda, Swa Lordy 60, Nted, Cool 6303. Happens all the time. So look for those things. This is all low-hanging fruit. This stuff isn't actually that hard to fix. 
But this, this stuff kind of makes a, a big difference to the, the, the entire expectations and the, entire, the sort of flow and transition to the service. Error messages, they're the, the big lost uh, design opportunity. Right? I, I showed you that um, Deutsche Bahn ticket machine. Things go wrong, so know that they're gonna go wrong and, and, and design for it. Design something that, that empathizes with people and shows that, okay, something's going wrong and we're gonna deal with it. Don't just show. I, I, can't get, I, I can't believe the amount of times I've seen screens in public spaces like airports or wherever else that's got one of those little Windows XP uh, things floating around and going, please reboot your system. And I just think, wow, that's, that's a, a lost opportunity. Saying sorry to people really matters. Um, this is from Australia. In Australia, um, the Aboriginal com community were really subject to pretty much genocide uh, from, unfortunately, from the British when, we, uh, when they went over. And for a very long time, been asking governments to say sorry, to apologize. And, you know, prime ministers going, yeah, we, we deeply regret, but they wouldn't actually say sorry because they were worried about land claims. And when, I think this is 2006, when they finally did say sorry, the, the Prime Minister then, Prime Minister Rudd said sorry. It was a really, really emotional moment. So, you know, again, it's about understanding a human relationship, whether you're delivering a service as a government um, or delivering it as a, a corporation or it's a, even a sort of small service. Actions speak louder than words. So when you say we are, you know, deliver excellence in service and so forth, and you don't, then you know, what you do makes much more of a difference than what you say. And the classic one is being on hold, right? So you call up a call center and they say, your call is really important to us. And then half an hour later, you're still hearing, your call is really important to us, please hold. And what they're really saying through their actions is, hmm, your call is not important to us at all. Go take a jump. Okay. Actions speak louder than words, and small, small acts make a big difference. The reason why relationships flounder because someone won't say those three words of I love you, or the reason why little notes like this make a difference is because as humans we relate to them. So often attending to, the, to, to those kinds of details and thinking, you know, how would this be if I was, to, uh, if I was a human? Would I, would, I, would I communicate in this way? Um, is a really good way of kind of thinking about how I can create that kind of empathy. Um, it also defines the tone of voice. So this is a hotel in, uh, in London called the Hoxton Hotel. And um, they really try to have a different kind of persona and a different attitude to most hotels and try and do things differently. And they look for all different touch points. Some of them are really banal. Like here's a, window, a sign for the, how to open the window. Right? And in hotels, you, know, you can only tip, tip the windows. You can't actually fully open them, so you can't jump out. And uh, it says, stupid sign number one, this window only tilts, okay? And then this is the thing about them having to lock down their iPads that they have in the lobby. And it says, Mr. A. Lock, head of security. That's a little funny joke. So all the time, you know, wherever they are, instead of thinking, we'll just do what everyone else does, here's an opportunity to, to um, show personality. And you can also use those things to demonstrate empathy. So this is a microwave oven, and it has a button that says, a bit more. or these toilet signs, for example, right? <laughs> so tending to those details is important. Again, it's, it's showing the kind of human relationship. It shows that you understand. The only danger is sometimes is that you can, you can spend ages de designing a really beautiful touch point. So this is a, a sort of security key generator thing that I get from my bank in England called First Direct. Um, and they design their stuff really nicely. It arrived in a really nice package. Um, it's also very clearly laid out. And the only thing is that's happening in a context, okay? So in the context of my life, where I, I'm English, but I live in Germany, I also work in Switzerland, is I have three of these now, um, and they're hanging around in my bag. So that beautifully designed touch point sort of just becomes one more bit of cruft in my, I don't know how you translate cruft, sorry, junk in my, um, in my life. So, the way to sort of really understand this with services and understand the larger context is you really need to prototype them and iterate that in real life. So this is an insurance, um, some insurance material that uh, LiveWork were designing. And 
they, this, this woman on the, on the top left picture, this woman on the left, she's a, a really an insurance salesperson. This is actually Laverans again, trying to sort of go through the process of buying insurance. They tested out call center stuff to try out, you know, had a researcher on either end of the call uh, to see what it was like when they had a sort of mock-up website. Uh, in the bottom left here, they've got real people who are actually trying to buy insurance, real customers, and this woman. And they're going through all the process so that they really understand it. The guy here on the bottom right, um, obviously with insurance, you can't, you can't force someone to have an accident just to see, you know, what's it like when you make a claim? I suppose you could do. Um, this guy had recently had an accident. He'd, re he'd been through the process. And so they showed him the sort of prototype and said, you know, how would this be? And this was a lot about um, communication and feedback that Jess was talking about, you know, because otherwise you make a claim and then you hear nothing for ages and then you maybe get your money. And, and it was all about actually giving feedback through that part of the process. Most services involve large infrastructure. So if you think of all the major services in, in, in life, things like communications, mobility, healthcare, uh, financial services, um, all of those things are, are very, very big infrastructure things. And when those, it, it's incredibly common Lisa mentioned this morning, it's incredibly common for big requirements documents to be written and then it gets made and there's nothing in between at all. And it can be a very, very expensive mistake. And there's nervousness on both sides. Designers are trying to kind of work out, you know, is it, what's, what's the sort of design case here as, as we iterate it? But so are the business people too. So the pilot studies, uh, pilot projects where you're, you're trying out a small part of the service where you're getting all the moving parts uh, are really the way to kind of bridge that confidence, bridge that gap. And really my last couple of things, are, one is to remember that if, as interaction designers or UX designers, you're, you're designing stuff often for people's use on screens, but their usage of those screens happens in a context. Okay, so your, people aren't just not just kind of eyeballs and brains and just looking at a screen, that this stuff is happening in some kind of other context and understanding that is incredibly important. And, you know, there's a tendency to think, well, there's a new technology, there's a new version of it, um, and this is going to solve everything. But technology doesn't always help. I'm going to be quiet and let the translators catch up with this bit. I don't know if they can read it. So he's saying, just in case they can't read it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dumping, be warned, I'm dumping you when I get home tonight. And she goes, fine, I was thinking we could do some time apart anyway. What? Jenna, I, I, I meant to say I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm jumping you, not dumping you, and now you're telling me you want to break up? Well, this is awkward. Okay, so please, please remember when you're designing things you're, you're across multiple channels and you're, you've got tran people are transitioning constantly between those different channels, tune back into the, the, the human element. It's the most important bit, and it really makes a difference to the rest of the design. Thank you very much. <laughs>